this morning, um, if you brought your word with you, and I hope you do bring your word with you every Sunday, I want to go ahead and give you some places so that you can go ahead and mark. We're going to be in Romans 8. Hallelujah. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And then we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5. Romans 8, 2 Corinthians 6, Galatians chapter 5, all in the New Testament. As I said earlier, I've had this verse rolling around from Zechariah in my, in my heart all week. But even longer than that, over the past several weeks, even the past few months, I know, I have had a scripture from Romans 8 that just rolls around in my heart and in my spirit. You've probably heard it come out in a few sermons that if we have the spirit of the living God, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, if he is living in us, he is in us to provide righteousness and life. That's what the word says. He's not just in us to touch our physical bodies. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit if we know Jesus. The Holy Spirit of God takes residence in our heart. But the temple of the Holy Spirit, it it doesn't just represent, it is our physical body, but it's our whole being. Our mind, our soul, and our spirit. So if the Spirit of the Lord lives in us, He brings life to all of us. Mind, body, soul, and spirit. This morning, I want us to look at Romans 8. I'm going to read verses 3 through 11, beginning with verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not by the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I want to stop right here. This is Paul's writing. He is reminding us here that there was no person that could live up to the law. There was no person that could live a sinless life without the Spirit of the living God, without the help of the Holy Spirit, and that God chose to put all the sin of the world on Jesus to forever condemn sin so that we could be free in the name of Jesus. That is what he is saying here, okay? Verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, is spiritual death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God. It's, it's resistant to God. It's, it's in opposition of God. For it does not submit to God's law. Instead, it, uh, indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who were of the flesh, in the flesh, operating and living according to the flesh, cannot please God. You, however are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. He's talking about those who've received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Hear me, he's not talking about active sin. He's not approving active sin. He's saying because we live in a fallen, sinful world, we know that when sin came, the, the body began to decay, the earth began to decay. That's what he's talking about here. Okay, so for the mind that is set on the flesh is, 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 is dying a spiritual death. The mind that is set on the spirit is, is pleasing to the Lord and is alive in righteousness. However, we are not of the flesh, he says. But if we are in Christ, although our bodies and this world is wasting away, there is a life that we can have, that eternal life in Christ that we can have in our soul because of Christ's righteousness, because of his righteousness being applied to our lives. Then verse 11, it says this, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. But the key word here is if. 
if he dwells. To dwell is to live. To dwell is to remain. To dwell is to take up residence and stay. You're not just passing through. He doesn't just come and go. He dwells. He remains. He rests there. There's an obvious, obvious knowing of ourselves and of others when we have the Spirit of the living God abiding in us. Let's pray together if we could. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, Father, I ask you now for an anointing, God, to speak your word. With the mind of Christ, the authority of Christ, Lord, with a humble spirit, God, I ask you now, anoint my mind, anoint my mouth to speak, and anoint our hearts, O oh Lord, to be soft and open to your voice, that your voice would be all that is heard today, Lord, in the mighty, strong name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I want to just, I want to ask you something and and, and just get your, you to lift your hands in just a moment. But as I've lived in just a a Christian environment as an adult, being in and out of, of, of different churches, I've heard and even thought at times there's three kinds of people in the world. There are those who are saved They truly know Jesus, like they have the Holy Spirit living, active, operating in their lives, right? They rely on the Holy Spirit to help them to live. There are those who are unsaved. They don't know Jesus. They don't have the Holy Spirit in their lives, right? And then there are those that we sometimes think of or call carnal Christians. You ever heard the phrase carnal Christian? If you have, raise your hand. Raise your hand. A worldly Christian. Okay. This is what I believe from, from searching the Scripture, from reading the Scripture. I believe with all my heart Jesus is coming soon. And I believe that he wants to prepare his church, his bride. And I believe what he needs us to see is he did not send his son Jesus to die and then send the Holy Spirit to us to be life and peace so that we could be carnal Christians. I don't know that I believe in carnal Christians. You're either his or you're not. You're full of the Spirit or you're not. Right? And so that's what I believe that we're going to see this morning. This is not judgment. This is, this is the truth from God's Word. The fact that there is a line that is drawn. And I believe it's that line that's drawn in front of the cross. And when you step over and you give your life to Jesus, He supplies you with everything you need for life and godliness. But we don't get to hover around the line. We have to stay on the side of righteousness. Let's look at some things this morning. I believe that these, these, these carnal Christians are those who they've accepted Jesus at some point in their life. They prayed the prayer. They may go to church, right? They're not in obvious, blatant rebellion or disobedience to the Lord. But they do not have a living, active Holy Spirit operating in their life, relying on the Holy Spirit and really living by the power of the Holy Spirit. We all have a sinful nature. Just because we get saved doesn't mean that our sinful nature goes away, right? Just because we accept Jesus, he doesn't come and just replace the sinful nature. He doesn't come and just replace our flesh, right? So we all have this sinful nature that we have to contend with. It's called flesh. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, we believe that he came, he died, he rose again, victorious over death and hell, so that we can be victorious over sin, In our lives, we believe he's our savior. He saved us. He's rescued us. He's delivered us from the power of sin. That's what it means to say, I believe you're my savior. But then to say that I believe you're my Lord means I believe you are the master of my heart. You're the king of my heart. I follow you. Like you are my leader. He's going to come again one day and we're going to have to stand before him. We're going to have to give an account for the situation of our heart. The status of our heart. Is it going to line up with the word of God? And is he our Lord? He said, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not just Savior. So therefore, that means that we can't have a carnal nature living in us and leading our lives when he's given us the power to overcome all those things. Revelation chapter 3. I, don't, I didn't ask you to mark this. I just want to reference this right quick. You'll know this scripture. Revelation 3, 15 and 16. 
This is where Jesus comes and he gives this wonderful revelation to John and he's talking to the church here. He's talking to the church of Laodicea, but he's talking to the church of Jesus Christ. He's talking to all of us that belong to him. And he says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Lukewarm here. Listen, I need you to understand what this means because I think there's so many times we have, we have churches, and I don't mean I'm not excluding ours. Churches, we are the church. We don't operate within the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't operate within the authority of the Holy Spirit that God's given us. And I believe as the days get darker, right? As the days get darker and more and more things that are evil begin to prevail, we are going to have to know who we are and what we believe. We're going to have to know this. We cannot be lukewarm. Lukewarm means to fluctuate between being sluggish, inactive, and dull in your spiritual life versus being fervent, passionate, and zealous about God. Lukewarm. You're, 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 you're between, somewhere between being dull, uninterested, inactive in your walk with the Lord, and being passionate and zealous. The Lord said, I don't want you to be there. I don't want you to be there. That's literally the Greek biblical definition. That's not Webster's or Miriam. Okay, that is the Greek biblical definition. He says, I don't want you to be lukewarm. As I study the word, I believe with all my heart. There is not, just, not, not such thing as a carnal, worldly Christian. You can't say, G- I love Jesus, but. There's no but. If you love Jesus, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Right? I love Jesus, but. There's, there's no but. Because he gave his son. So that we would have power over sin. There's, there's, there's no room for it. He says, you're either my child or you're not. You're alive in Christ or you're not. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ, the Bible says. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ active, alive, dwelling in your heart doesn't belong to Jesus. If the spirit is in you. He provides righteousness and life. We are drawn to righteousness. There can be no, there's no room for carnal nature. There's no, no room for sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all slip up. We all mess up. We all make mistakes. But there's never an excuse. We have to own it and say, oh God, I have sinned against you, oh Lord. Because that's what we do. We're not sinning. It's not so much against ourselves. It's not against our church. It's not against our beliefs. It's not against our parents. It's we've sinned against you, oh God. And yes, there's grace to lift us back up. But what the Lord is showing us over and over in his scripture is there's really no excuse. Jesus is the only one that lived a, a sinless life. He's the only one that ever will live a sinless life. However... The more you understand of who you are and the more you get full of the word and the more you get full of the Holy Spirit and give the Holy Spirit control in your life, the less you're going to sin. That's just the truth. The less that we're going to sin and the more that he is going to have an influence and a power in our lives. 1 Corinthians. This is another one I just pulled. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 2 says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and drink the cup of demons. You cannot participate in the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Again, this is Paul writing. He's writing again to the church. He's talking about the body of Christ through the Lord's Supper. The church of Corinth, what they were doing is they were kind of double-sided. They were carnal Christians, right? They, were, they would come and they would partake of the Lord's Supper. And they would, to take of the Lord's Supper says, I believe you died, you gave your life. Now, now I've accepted forgiveness and I am yours and I'm going to declare that you are my Lord till you come back or that you've saved me till you come back. But at the same time, they would go and they would offer idols to sacrifices. There, was, there were two-sided. They were double-sided. And Paul came and he said, you can't be both. You serve one or the other. Jesus said the same thing. You can't serve two masters. You're either mine or you're not. You serve the Lord or you don't. This is what he said, because your heart will be divided. You will be devoted to one more than the other. And whatever the one has, whatever has your heart, where your heart is, right, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So whatever we treasure most, it reveals our heart. 
And the Lord judges our heart. Paul was telling the church here, it's the, the way that we live. Which one do we choose? What are we going to honor? Because you can't honor both God and something that is not of God. You can't do it. You can't honor it. You can't serve it. See, they didn't understand the seriousness and the dangers of compromise, of being mixed with the world. They didn't understand it. The world here, when you read world in Scripture, world doesn't mean earth. Okay, earth. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. The earth, the creation, the earth, the actual planet earth, okay? But the world represents a worldly system. It's our culture. It's our, our society. It's the things that, it's our, our political beliefs. It's, it's, it's more of a, a, a mindset. World, it is anything that is in opposition to the Lord. When we read of things that are of the world, it's things that have not um, um, been sanctified by God. Like people that have not been transformed are of the world. They're of the world. And Paul was warning them here. You cannot be compromised. You cannot be mixed with the world if the spirit of the living God is alive in you. If the spirit of God is living and active in you. That small little word is so powerful. That small little word is so powerful. What we entertain matters. What we think about matters. The things we say matters. The things we participate in matters. The things we view matters. If we we know Jesus, truly know him, and the Spirit of God is in us, we will either strengthen him in our lives or we will weaken him in our lives, not just by our faith, but also by our lifestyle, our lifestyle, our choices. We either strengthen the Spirit of God within us or we weaken because what it is is it's truly a matter of of, of his control. And I hate to use the word control because people think he takes over your body or something, your, your, um, his, his influence. It's a matter of how much influence does he have. The world will tell you, that everything's not black and white. There's some gray area. And grace is to cover the gray area. But the closer I get to the Lord, and the more I walk with Him, I believe there's gray areas. But I do not believe God has intended that. I believe what the gray area is, is when we move across that line, and we allow things to mix with the world, or the world to mix with us, and it, and it shouldn't be there. The more I study this word, there's this, this, this gray category should not be there if we are full of the Holy Spirit of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what partnership does good have with evil? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord or what blending, what harmony has Christ with Belial? And and this is a different word, another word for Satan. And that word actually means crook or thief. Like what, what, what partnership, what fellowship, what blending does Christ have with him? What portion or part does a believer share with an unbeliever? There's no gray. There's no gray. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. There's righteousness and good and things that are like God. Or there's lawlessness, evil, and things that are like Satan. See, we think because it doesn't look harmful, because it doesn't look bad, because everybody else is doing it, that it's not evil. Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Satan's going to make you think that it doesn't matter. It's not going to hurt you. Everybody's doing it. It's a gray area, and grace will cover it. Grace is the powerful grace of God that draws us to repentance. We are saved by the grace of God. It's that same grace that can give you the power by the Holy Spirit in you not to cross the line into sin. It will help you. 
It will draw you back when you do. But I am telling you, I, the longer I serve the Lord and the, the closer I get to Him, I can see through Scripture over and over if we have accepted Him, there is no room for darkness in our life. There's no room for anything unclean to remain there. He says where the Spirit of God is. Where the Spirit of God is living, there is no partnership with evil, there is no fellowship with darkness, and there's no harmony or blending with anything that represents ungodliness. There's none. There's no gray area, because the gray area represents compromise. The gray area represents a weakness in our life, where we've, some people will say, well, we've let our guard down. You know, we become soft. We let our guard down. And so we step over into something and we say, well, it was a gray sin. It was a little sin. It was a little lie. It was just a white lie. It's still a lie. I'm not talking about, you know, hiding a surprise party from somebody. You know what we're talking about. We know. We know what a lie is. Paul here, in the, and I'm not going to read the rest of it, but if you go on down in some of those verses in 2 Corinthians, he, he's, he's already reminded us over and over, Paul reminds us over and over that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Like that our body is the dwelling place of the presence of God. And then here in the 2 Corinthians, he says, he, he reminds them of a quote back from, uh, I think it's Isaiah and Ezekiel. He reminds them of this, and he, he tells them, he says, if you will come out from amongst them, if you will separate yourself from the things that are unclean and unpure, if you will do that, then he has promised to be there. He said, I'll be your God, you will be my people. But that promise comes to those who will make the choice to separate themselves and not live in compromise. I'm not saying, we all fall short. We are not perfect people. We make mistakes, but we quickly, we quickly get up and run to the Lord. He is calling us back to a place of purity as a church. He's calling us back to a place of being unified with him in Christ as believers. Do you know one of the things I believe, the reason the Lord doesn't want us to be lukewarm it's because what would the enemy like more than anything else than to have a church full of compromised, weak Christians that are not making a difference in the world, that are always defeated, always struggling? That's exactly what he wants. And that's why the Lord says, I don't want you to be there. Don't, don't stay there. And now we have this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to truly find freedom from everything that tries to overcome us. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm not going to read this one. I just want to refer to this. Uh, I, want to, I think it's around verse 19. It tells us don't quench the Holy Spirit of God. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. But it says examine everything about our life. And then it says hold on to what is good and get rid of what is evil. Examine everything about our life our life it says and hold on to what is good get rid of what is evil but it doesn't say just what is evil it says get rid of the things that are the appearance of evil it doesn't even have to be bad it just looks bad do we understand get rid of it don't allow things that look evil to be in your life that look like darkness don't even allow it to come close to you don't allow it Finally, Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read 16 and 17, and then 24 and 25. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. 
The Bible says, if, if the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in us, if he does, then we should have a righteous life. It doesn't mean we won't make mistakes, but there should be life because he says, I give you life and I give you peace. Listen, when we are not at peace and our mind is chaotic and our world is chaotic and when we feel like things are all out of order and there's no life, we're just everything's drained out of us, we need to go back to 1 Thessalonians. We need to go back and examine everything. We need to hold on to what is good and we need to get rid of anything that even has the appearance of evil in our life. We must do this. The Lord has promised us the same, think about it, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us if we know him. It's the power to do everything that he commands. It's the power to not do the things that he forbids. We talked about this Wednesday night in Bible study. Where, where, where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things. I can do what I'm supposed to do and I can stay away from what I'm not supposed to do. By the same power. The same power that you can believe for salvation. The same power that you can pray for your friends. The same power that you can believe for healing. The same power. The same thing that we worship him with. The same things that we set our, our heart on. All of those. That same power. The same life is the same life that we have to abstain from evil. Matthew, if you guys will come on, please. Until Jesus comes back, there is always going to be a battle between flesh and between spirit. Always. It is never going to end. There's always going to be a battle between flesh and between spirit. Your flesh represents your carnal, sinful nature. It can be seen in things such as this. These are sins according to the word of God. Okay? It can be seen in things like this. Unwholesome talk, which is foul language. Lies. Gossip. Judging others. It can also extend into deeper sins. The uh, the word calls it strife, jealousy, rage, division, drunkenness, Sexual sins, addiction, there's unforgiveness. See, we only want to focus on the big sins. But the Lord says even, I'll use this for an example. The Lord says if if a man looks on a woman with lust in his heart, he's already committed adultery with her. But we think, oh no, it's only a sin if you cross the line. This is not judgment. But God is calling His church to rise up and be the people He's given us the power to be. So that we can walk into the world and we can hold our heads up high. And we know that it's not us, but it's the Spirit of God. God said, I am the lifter of your head. I'm the lifter of your head. So you can hold your head up and you can say, I am not a perfect person, but I've got someone that's living inside of me. And He gives me the boldness and He gives me the power and He gives me the love to be able to do everything that he's called me to do. All the things that I don't know how. All the things that I don't understand. To love the people that are so unlovable. To forgive the people that have hurt me. That's what he desires from us. And to walk in victory. Not by might, not by power, but by the spirit of the living God being alive and active inside of us. There is no mountain that is too big in your life that he cannot make it a flat plain. Nothing. Nothing. There's no addiction that has you that God cannot speak to. It is going to require something of you. It is going to require something of you. You are going to have to put some effort into it. But it requires first that you believe. Do you believe? That's the very first thing he says. Do you believe? Do you believe that I have come to set you free? That's the whole reason we named this church Freedom Church. It's not so much about people coming in in droves and being saved. Oh, how we long for that. But it truly is that when when the Son sets you free, when the Spirit of the living God sets you free, you are free indeed. You are free. Like you are free. The enemy may come to try to tempt you again. He may come and try to lie to you again. But he has no power and no authority over you. None unless you give in to Him. 
this battle between the flesh and the spirit are going to go on forever. And it affects your whole being. It affects your mind. It affects your body. And it affects your spirit. And the truth is, the struggle is dependent. The, the end of this is all dependent upon which one is stronger. Which one is stronger? Is our flesh stronger or is our spirit stronger? Which one is stronger? We can yield to the flesh and we can give in to sin or we can press in and use the delegated authority that God has given us to take a stand against the enemy. Every lying spirit, every spirit of fear, everything. We have, it's not about us. See, we're like, well, I don't know how to do that. And I don't, I don't understand that. And it's just me. I get it. It's just me. But it's not just us. It is the spirit of the living God alive in us. And when we get that, when we get that, there is, there is no mountain too big, no obstacle too big that you cannot overcome it. There is nothing. Oh, there is nothing too big. God, help us. Oh, Jesus. I want to give you two words. <laughs> two words in the Bible, in the New Testament, for the power of God. I want to give you these two words. The first is the word dunamis. The power of the Holy Spirit. Dunamis, it's where we get our word dynamite. It is like, boom, power. You know, God shows up. Powerful. Right? Power. Dunamis. D-U-N-A-M-I-S. Look it up. It gives us the power to do everything He's commanded and everything He's called us to do. That's why we can hold our head up high. Then this is the second word. Exosia. E-X-O-U-S-I-A. Look it up in the Greek. It means a delegated authority. A delegated power. Jesus said, I came. I gave my life and I died a brutal death so that you would not have to struggle and you wouldn't have to be, be bound all of your life. And I'm now I'm delegating my authority to you so that you have the power to live above sin. He gives us the power to do, dunamis, and He gives us the power not to do. When the tempter comes, we have the power of the living God inside of us if we know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you forfeit that power. If He's not active and living inside of you, we forfeit that promise of that power in our lives. Oh God, help us. This battle, this struggle is going to continue until Jesus comes back. Paul said, for those who live according to the flesh, they set their mind on things of the flesh. And those who live, you walk according to the Spirit. You set your mind on things of the Spirit. Hear me. You want to know, you want to know whether the Spirit of God is alive and active and leading and directing and guiding your life and convicting your life, correcting your life. Those are good things. You want to know that? What are you thinking on? What are you thinking on? I'm not talking about when you're at work and you're engaged and you're doing what's required to get through the day, right? You're, you're working, you're doing what's required. But when you are, when you are still, when you're at peace, when you are quiet, when the TV's off and nobody's around, what are you thinking on? Because the Word of God says He wants to, He has already, He's already empowered you to be able to come over every, come against everything that tries to come. The battle starts here. The enemy starts here. There is no weapon formed against you that will prosper if you will grab a hold of what Jesus is saying in this Word right here. There's no weapon. There's no lie that the enemy can bring to you that will defeat you if you will take a hold of what Jesus is saying in the Word. Hallelujah. We have to consciously, intentionally set and fix. That word set is literally like a cement. 
That's what that means in the, in the scripture when you study it out. To set it like in cement. We have to set our mind on things above. Set our mind on things of God. When worry tries to come. And we just worry, 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 worry. What does the Bible say? Worry is not going to help you at all. You can't fix it. You just lose that time in your life. We do it. We all fall short. But the quicker we go, I'm not supposed to worry. You don't give me a spirit of fear, which is worry, but of power of love and a sound mind. And we set our mind, God, I'm going to trust in you. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will, we'll remember the name of the Lord our God. We'll remember everything you've done for us, God. That's where I'm going to set my mind. I'm going to remember all you've done for me. I'm going to begin to thank you for all you've done for me. We set our mind intentionally on things above. We set our mind on the Word of God. That's why we hide it in our heart. So when things come up, we've got something to use as a weapon against our enemy. Young men, when those images try to come into your mind at night that have no right being there, you begin to pray for that person. Pray for that person because the devil don't want you praying for them. Begin to pray for their salvation. Begin to pray God will set them free. I'm telling you, Begin to plead the blood of Jesus over your own mind, over your own life. And do the things you need to do to get those things out of your heart and out of your life. It's going to cost us something. If we know that we have an addiction, don't go near it. Don't go near it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to remind you again of Zechariah. Not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. This, this mighty obstacle, mighty, mighty mountain, and not literally a mountain, but an obstacle was in the way of God's people accomplishing His will. An enemy force was standing between them and the purpose of God. Something was hindering them from being all that they were supposed to be. And God very clearly said, it is not by might nor by power, but it is by my spirit. When you get a hold of that, when you say, God, I don't know how and I don't understand it, but I know that you are with me and I know that you are for me. Now I ask you now just to give me the strength, right, to believe your word, to stand on your word. It truly begins with believing. Believe that He loves you so much that He has given you every... When it says He's given you everything you need for life and godliness, He's given you everything you need to succeed in this life. That's not riches. That's every weapon that we need. He's given it to us. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask them to play something. If you are here today, this is, I, I believe this with all of my heart. This is what the Lord desires us to hear today. There is no excuse in the life of a believer for us to tolerate sin. There's no excuse to tolerate sin. Like there needs to be something inside of us that raises up as a child of God, a son or daughter of God that says, I will no longer do this. I will no longer let you have authority in my life in this place because He's given me all authority that I need. All authority. I don't know who this is for. I'm telling you, I have wrestled all week and God has called. There is someone here today that I know that I know that I know. There may be multiple. I don't know. But God wants to set you free. I mean, completely free. Oh, God, help us. Oh, God. Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask them to sing. If you're here today, and first of all, you do not know Jesus never accepted him in your life or you're not living for him 
I'm asking you, please don't leave this place that way today. Please come to the altar. This is an altar of grace. An altar is a place where altar means to change, right? You alter something, you change it. This is a place to come in. And it truly is about making a step of faith and moving towards. This altar is nothing special. But your heart making a step of faith to move towards God in His presence and saying, God, I am by faith. I'm going to make a move towards you so that you will alter this in my life. If you don't know Jesus, today is the best day of your life if you'll receive Him. If you're here and you and maybe you've got some known sin, maybe you've got a habitual sin, maybe you've got an addiction, maybe you've got an area of lukewarmness or compromise, it will create a weakness in your life and it will eventually create spiritual death in your life and sin will separate you from God. And He is by His love today. Oh, by His powerful grace today. He is calling us to Him. So as they play, I want to open this altar. And I believe with all my heart, the Lord wants to set us free. Oh, God, He wants to fill us again with His love. But He wants to fill us to an understanding of we have the same Spirit of God inside of us that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And there's nothing that we can't overcome. He wants to reveal that to some hearts today. We'll be here to pray with you. Will we allow the Lord just to have His way now? Jesus, in Your name, we come, O God. We humble ourselves before You, Jesus. I ask you now, Lord, to search every heart and test every mind. Lord, your spirit can come. It is life and it is peace. But it will reveal the dark places in our heart. It will reveal the compromised places in our heart, the weak places in our walk with Christ. So now I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and do that. So that when we walk out of here, every single one of us can walk out full of the boldness of God and the love of God. In the name of Jesus, have your way, God. Do your work as only you can do. We love you, Lord. Matthew, if you guys will lead us. The altars are open. We're here to pray with you. us enough and I know there's, there's there's one or more in here that you're speaking very directly to you've had it so heavy on, on Kim's heart that you'll stop a service that you'll direct a service that you'll birth a word out of travail from the depths of your heart so that someone can hear Lord, as she was sharing, and even, even in the room now, God, I'm sure different people have a different sense of anything, but God, there's something to the fear of the Lord. Your word says that it is, a, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So, Father, you are love, but the last portion of your name speaks of the fact that you must be just. So in love you reach out, but Ultimately, God, we will stand before you. 
And I just pray, Father, all that you desired to come forth, Lord, all that you've desired, Lord, to touch and to stir, let the fear of God move in this room. It's no longer time to play. The word that came to my heart while she was preaching is you said it's, it's high time that we awake from our slumber. And it is a serious thing that you're calling us to, God. So, Lord, have your way. Speak to every heart. Convict God powerfully. And let eyes be opened to what you're trying to say, God. You long to set free, but they cannot be, Lord, until they relent and they humble before you. So thank you for loving us enough, God, today to reach out and to challenge us with that. Thank you, God.